Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's conversation with the CTOs of Makaru and Tonic. My name is Kiara. I'm on the marketing team at Tonic, and today we're going to focus our talk on software architecture, specifically the choices that were made in building two fake data generation platforms from the ground up. Before I introduce those platforms, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers. We're very glad to have Mark Bricado, founder and CTO of Makaru, and Andrew Colombi, co-founder and CTO of Tonic, joining us today to, to share what they've learned. We've got a lot of great questions already lined up to ask them, but um, this is a perfect time to say that we really want to hear your questions. So please send them my way in the chat or in the Q&A at any time. I'm gonna try and ask them as they come up because uh, we really wanna make this as much of an audience-led conversation as possible. So first, before getting into the questions, I'm gonna provide a quick like high-level overview of Makaru and Tonic and kind of the key difference between them that defines the use cases for each tool. Many of you are probably already familiar with Makaru. It's the online data generator that allows you to create mock data from scratch. It's got an extremely intuitive UI. It's got a free tier. Uh, you can just hop online and quickly spin up smaller data sets on the fly. It's also got several paid tiers, including an enterprise tier that allows you to deploy the software on-prem. The key distinction of its approach to data generation is that it employs rules-based data synthesis. In other words, it allows users to define the rules of the data they need and then generates the data based on those rules. So for example, maybe you need birth dates specifically between 1960 and 1990, or you need to manage the, the categorical frequency of male to female to null across a data set. Since Makaru doesn't require any seed data to start with, it's really useful when you're building a brand new application and you don't have any data to work with, or maybe you need to spin up massive data sets for load testing. Another common use case is creating realistic mock data sets for sales demos. Makaru has thousands of users from development teams of one to enterprise customers like Salesforce. And it also has a very active community online. If you haven't already checked it out, you can, I, I highly recommend it. You can compare techniques, learn new tips. And Mark, Mark also hops in there as well to answer questions sometimes. When Tonic was founded, um, Makaru was already a, a leading tool in the space. And our, our co-founders reached out early on to Mark to, to learn more about his experience and, and his success as well. At the same time, um, we also set out to do things a little differently. We were looking to solve for a problem that our founders had run into in their own careers, which is specifically the problem of having production data that is too sensitive to share with developers for use in testing and development. Where Makaru is rules-based and, and can also equip developers with rules-based data, Tonic generates data based on your existing data by using your data as a seed. So a big part of what Tonic enables is secure de-identification. And when you combine that de-identification, you can also call it anonymization, obfuscation, with our database subsetting and synthesis capabilities, what, we, what you get is what we are calling data mimicking. Um, so our core use case from the start has been enabling developers with useful, safe test data that looks and feels real because it's made from production data. With Tonic, uh, the way it works is you connect directly to your database. And we support a, a long list of databases from Postgres to Redshift to MongoDB, which we recently launched. Uh, and once you've connected to your database, you build a model of your data, then using that model, Tonic will transform your data in flight and hydrate a separate output database with secure de-identified data. But it preserves all the utility and complexity of the original data. So our use cases specifically are uh, getting production data out of your lower environments to equip developers with safe data, protecting sensitive data uh, for compliance, you know, legislation, uh, privacy laws, data security and risk mitigation, or we also um, en enable many teams to create targeted subsets of massive data sets. So it's easier to manage the data, maybe on a local laptop, and it's also easier for debugging and QA. QA. Much like Makaru, um, we've, we've found a strong response for a need for what we've built. Our customers include eBay, PwC, uh, VMware, many healthcare companies like Everlywell and Allegis. They represent a broad cross-section of industries, but at each we're speeding up development cycles by making it quick and easy for developers to get the data they need. The last thing um, I'll quickly mention before we jump into our questions for Mark and Andrew is um, I'm sure many of you have already tried, use, uh, tried out using uh, Makaru in some form, either as a paying customer or on their free tier. And we're excited to share that Tonic recently launched our own free tier of sorts in the form of a developer sandbox. So if you're interested in trying this out as well, you can pop on over to our website. I'm gonna show you where that is. Uh, yeah, here, and you can sign up for a developer sandbox right here. Uh, or even better, we are hosting a hands-on workshop next week. You can go to the webinars page. And at the workshop, we will provision sandbox accounts and kind of guide you through um, learning the ropes of using Tonic. 
I'll put a link to this in the chat as well for any of you who are interested. All right, I think that's enough of the high level overview. Uh, let's switch to the topic of the day, software architecture. And I think the best place to start would be to have um, Mark, Andrew, if you guys could lay some groundwork by answering the high level question of what is software architecture? Oh, you're muted. Sorry, I guess I'll start. You know, uh, when you always get these kind of questions in interviews where it's like some obvious thing that you should be able to explain and you're like, uh, I don't know. But um, so software architecture, I think the way I think about it is kind of the way that I think about trying to organize teams. Uh, you know, software is a bunch of components and, and ever more these days with AWS and Azure and all these cloud environments, putting together a piece of software architecture is trying to figure out the different components and the different ways that they'll interact to accomplish a task. The same way of putting together a team of people is figuring out how to make use of everybody's best skill sets and resources to solve a, a certain task. Yeah, and I, uh, I agree with that analogy. Um, there are some like, there are interesting ways that analogy actually feeds on itself, I think as well, which is um, when you set out to design you know, your company, you're going to be making trade-offs and compromises about which teams are going to be able to operate quickly together because they're like close to each other in the organization and which teams are going to be further apart. So that'll be more difficult for them to operate together. And the same is true with software. Um, the decisions you make about your architecture are going to make some things easy and some things really hard. Um, and it's all about finding those compromises. It's always about compromises in software architecture. So yeah, I, I, I do like that. Like, it's kind of like building a company, um, but in its own in its own way. You know, I've seen an interesting parallel come up. Like one of the most famous books in our space, I think, is Mythical Man Month, which talks mm -hmm. mostly about project management and assembling teams and whatnot. But one of the one of the theses in there was like the more people you add, doesn't make things go faster. It makes things mm -hmm. go slower because of all the communication points. And one of the big discussions in the architecture world today is like monoliths versus microservices. Mm -hmm. And I can definitely attest, I, I work in both extremes in, in my various lives. Makaru is an unashamed Ruby on Rails monolith. Love it. Uh, and, but I work a lot with microservices as well. And I can definitely say that every communication point you put between components makes life more difficult in certain yeah. ways. And it's like absolutely, absolutely a thing that uh, we think about, you know, at Tonic, uh, our application's a little more sophisticated, not, not more sophisticated, it's just, there's more pieces, you know, it's a bigger team, yeah, uh, yeah. More, more things going on, right? Uh, and, you know, it's like, do I want to add a queue, like a, a robust queuing system, like a queuing microservice? Or do I want to just like make it work with Postgres? And like yeah. both of those are valid approaches, depending on what you want to make easy, what you want to make hard, what how much you want to invest in this queuing service, how important is it that it be robust in these different ways? And it's not always the right answer to pick the best. You know, it's not always the right answer to say, like, well, we're gonna use SQS or RabbitMQ or you know Kafka for this queue that's gonna get, you know, a hundred messages a day. And uh, like we can put some retry logic in there, or whatever. Like uh, it, it's not always the right choice to pick the the what seems to be the the gold star of of, of whatever it might be. Yeah, hmm. for sure. That's and that's like the mythical man month. Sorry, just to bring that back. Like the mythical man month. There is like you know, it's like it's not always best to hire, add more people. You know, sometimes yeah. it's it's not best to add more blocks to your block diagram. Um, and you need to be very uh, economic or economical about about your architecture. Yeah, I totally agree. So what is one of the first considerations that kind of impacted the architecture that you went, that you chose? Was it um, maybe like the deployment environment, um, thinking along these lines? Yeah, you want me to go first or you wanna go first? Go ahead, Andy. Right. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I think there were two things that really impacted our, our original thinking, which is like, okay, first, we wanted to work directly against databases. Um, we wanted the input to be a database and the output to be a database. We thought that would be the easiest thing for our customers. And the second thing is we didn't want our customers to have to send their data to us. We knew that you know the data is going to be um, sensitive. That's why they're using Tonic and sending it to us might be a sales hurdle that we didn't want to have to deal with. Um, so those two things were really prominent in our minds when, when we, when we started to architect how this would work and, 
you know, uh, the second one kind of leads you to an on-prem path uh, or something that's going to be close to on-prem. And uh, the first one leads you to the first one being the databases, you know, that we wanted to go right from database to database. We really wanted uh, a, a, a language that we picked to, to have a broad support for a lot of different databases. Uh, it, so it needed to be very mainstream, you know. Um, I, I think in the data synthesis world, there are a lot of interesting academic problems out there. And some of them are more easily expressed in, in languages that aren't as widely adopted for database technology. So that was definitely something that, that, that weighed on our minds. <laughs> now I'll give you the totally opposite story, which was Makaru <laughs> started at very humble beginnings. I never even like considered making this a business for, for at least a year when I launched it. I literally was just, I, I had an itch I needed to scratch. I was working in a, a small life sciences startup that had you know a high, pi high price product with only a few users and I, I'd been there for years and I wanted to make something that a lot of people would use. And I also wanted to learn Ruby on Rails because <laughs> I've been working in Java forever and I wanted to learn something new. So it was literally like those two things. I chose the architecture just based on developing my resume, like unashamed. Hmm. And it turns out that it, it, by random luck, it was actually a really good choice because I still think today, if you're a one person or a 10 person or even like a 50 person startup, Rails is probably the best choice for most cases. Um, it's just so good at guiding you towards the pit of success uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and getting so much out of a team with no time and no resources. It does so many things for you. Um, where, you know, I had a lot of luck along the way. Eventually, Makru became popular enough to where larger companies started asking for an on-prem version. And it was like, oh, God, this is not going to be good. Ruby on Rails, on-prem. Um, Anybody who's ever had to set up a Ruby on Rails environment knows it's, it's a pain to set up natively. And thank God Docker has come along. Uh, and so I basically Big thumbs up. ship it. Yeah, I ship it as wrap as a Docker container. And enterprises can do all sorts of crazy things with that. Some people run it in Kubernetes and um, yep. all, you know, every, everything under the sun on every provider. So you know, thank God for that. But I, I never banked on that early on. Um, but I, you know, I have some of that same friction where I need to be able to run on-prem um, so fortunately, you know, the only real dependencies for Makaru is you got to have something that runs Docker, you got to run Redis somewhere, and you got to run uh, Postgres somewhere. But, you know, AWS provides all those things as services. So I got lucky. I didn't design it that way. Yeah. Just to one up on that Docker thing, like uh, 10 years ago when I worked at my last company, which is Palantir, and we did a bunch of on-prem installation back then too, like Docker was much more nascent. And we spent like two man years developing an installation software for Palantir. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, more probably if you look at the overall, but my team, my 30 person team, their product, two man years on installation. Yep. And I mean, I don't know if we've, we've spent like one man month on installation at Tonic because yeah. it's just yeah. Docker and done. Yeah. Wow. Mark, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, your use case when you first developed Makaru was uh, for healthcare data as well. How did that impact um, the architecture that you went with? Yeah, so I was leading a team of developers and QA, like maybe 15 people or so. And so this was a really complicated domain that like no one really learns about unless you happen to have been a scientist for a while in a, in a biology lab. So it's very difficult to have like junior QA engineers understand the domain to the extent that they can like put in valid test data when they're testing one of these long workflows. And so very quickly, like your product gets filled with this kind of garbage data and it makes it easy to test like the first part of the workflow, the first screen, but then like 10 screens later, it's just incomprehensible. So I, I built Makaru as an internal tool originally just to help engineers build data that had some integrity to it and kind of modeled the real world. Uh, and then, you know, I figured, hey, this might be useful for other people in other domains. And it's pretty easy to get some test data. At least that's what I thought at the time. And so I just, I put it up on the internet and it, it took off from there. It was like, one thing that was shocking is like almost from day one, people just materialized out of nowhere to start using it. I like didn't promote it. I didn't know how that happened. I think I answered one or two questions on Stack Overflow. And it's like, the internet is such a vast place that if you build something with any merit, like somebody will notice. Um, I, I never knew that going into it. It was like, this whole thing's been a linear experience from day one. I came from this very enterprisey kind of sheltered background in the beginning. 
Andrew, I feel like you kind of already touched on how the use case impacted things because you mentioned, you know, sensitive data, but if there's anything that you'd like to add there. Yeah, uh, you know, I, yeah, I think, I think I covered it. You know, databases wanting to rec directly access databases. Yeah, I think, I think that yeah. kind of covers my yeah. perspective. Um, well, there was one thing that you mentioned um, about, oh, oh, actually, Mark, uh, a question about how, when you had to make that switch to on-prem, did that did that change the architecture in any way? What, how did that influence things? It actually did. It kind of defined, in a way, the architecture for Makaru as it stands now. But it's it's hazy to remember whether it was the on-prem or the scale. So the, the background was uh, a very large company came to me on a very large project, and Makaru couldn't generate large data sets at that point. It literally did everything in the main web thread. It's just thrown <laughs> together and uh, <laughs> no background tasks, nothing. And, and the guy came to me, he's like, well, I need you to, I love your app. Like how, how much can you scale up? Can you generate like terabytes of data? And uh, you know, it sounded like a very lucrative contract. So I'm smart enough to know just to say yes and then figure it out later. Um, but I had to figure it out later. And, and what I arrived on, which is a very standard solution in the Rails space, is to use background workers with Sidekick to do things in parallel and to make use of multiple computers and multiple processors. So, uh, so I threw that together. And fortunately, that actually works out really well with the cloud model uh, that most companies install Makaru on. Um, you know, I had basically two types of Docker containers, an app instance that runs the website and then a worker instance that generates data. And then you can just have as many worker instances as you want, as long as you, you know, can foot the Amazon bill. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, like that all came about kind of at once uh, as I was, you know, developing the first on-prem solution. Okay. I, I, wanna, I wanna comment on something there. Uh, just if you're in this audience thinking like, you know, uh, I wanna do my own startup uh, at some point and like, you know, what architectural trade off should I make? The example Mark you just brought up of like you know everything was in the main web web uh, thread. It's like that's exactly the kind of architectural decision you should be doing. You should that's the first step. You shouldn't like. It's really easy, especially as an engineer, to think well you know well obviously this needs to be in a background thread. I should get that like going right away. Um, and it doesn't matter until it matters. Like your customers aren't going to care until, until it matters. And then when it does, you tell them it works and you fix it. I mean, yeah. like it's not, it, 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 it's very easy to get caught in the, you know, premature optimization, right? Yeah. That's what this is. Uh, and uh, I highly recommend anyone who's thinking about starting their own startup to be, you know, doing the unscalable things. Like these are the trade-offs that are okay to make because you can just say yes and fix it. Like, you know how to do it. It's just, you shouldn't do it until you need it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, actually, we have a question for you, Mark, from the audience. Do you recommend using Ruby on Rails when starting a new project today? Yes, I don't care what anybody says. Yes, I'll die on Ruby on Rails. I love it, uh, uh, you know, and I do a lot of other things. So it's not like I have a very slim background. Like I probably spend most of my life in front-end JavaScript, Next.js, uh, Vue, Svelte, um, React. Uh, I actually spent the entire last two months doing Rust programming, which is like the opposite end of the universe from Ruby on Rails. And they all have their merits, but where Ruby on Rails has its merit is if you're a small bootstrapped endeavor and you need to get something up and running and get to an MVP quickly, there's nothing better than Ruby on Rails. Uh, I don't care what anybody says. And there's still no better darn ORM than Active Record. Uh, hmm. <laughs> No, I've used I've used Hibernate in Java. I recently used Diesel in Rust, which is actually really good. Um, Active Record is still the OG. It's still the best. It, it gives you the most control over SQL. It just works. Um, you know, I don't care that Ruby on Rails has been around for a while. I've been around for a while. So what are you saying? <laughs> uh, I, I still think it's great. Um, so uh, if any project I start today, assuming it's the same kind of you know MVP seeking thing, I'll use Rails. And believe it or not, like Makro gets a ton of traffic. It's got thousands and thousands of daily active users and, you know, approaching a million, I think, like, you know, total people have signed up. And it still serves it on very cheap infrastructure, like way cheaper than probably other jobs I've done with more sophisticated teams. So you can get a long way with Ruby on Rails, um, especially if you do things in the background. Uh, so don't knock it until you try it.
Okay, I have a follow up question to that. Um, do you recommend even against PHP for a quick MVP? That's a, I, that's probably the, the two are competitors, I think, and and both would be reasonable choices. Um, I think in the end, I think your code winds up being more well factored and more maintainable in Rails than PHP. And I have always loved the the Rails approach to life, which is just like you bite off big chunks of functionality when you add a library and like everything is highly opinionated and thought through for you. And it seemed, it's always seemed to me to be put together by really talented people in that community. Some communities are lucky to have really talented people and some communities have like a lot of people and some of them are talented. Like the JavaScript community has like an endless amount of people, some of which are very talented, but many of which maybe you're not. Rails seems to be a smaller community, but really talented folks. So. I'd stand by it, but I, I think you're at least in the right ballpark if you're if you're comparing the two because both allow you to get up and running very quickly and, and uh, allow you to fail fast. Okay. Uh, Andrew, a question for you um, because we, we've heard a lot about um, the, the architecture that, that Mark has gone with. How did, how did Tonic sit down the team and weigh kind of the pros and cons of using different technologies uh, when we first started building the platform? Did you just yeah. grab what you knew and ran with it or did you did you kind of I know. No, it was a little bit more uh, thoughtful than just go with what we know. Um, I mean, certainly it's a column A and column B. There was like definitely, you know, we weren't considering things we didn't know at all. For example, Ruby on Rails. None of us knew Ruby on Rails. And so we didn't even consider it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Mark. Um, <laughs> but uh, we, we did look at, you know, um, well, we knew those initial things that we really needed to hit, right? We wanted to be able to do an on-prem installation. We wanted to be able to hit all the databases that are out there, including like the ones that you don't hear about as often, right? Like we knew that we would have customers that wanted DB2, which, you know, that's an ancient technology, truly ancient technology. But if you're working with like in, in FinTech or insurance, they're going to have DB2. So that like the desire to work with both ancient databases and new databases it kind of left, a, and by new databases, I mean, obviously Postgres, MySQL, but also newer, cooler things like uh, Spark um, or uh, MongoDB or Redshift, Snowflake, et cetera. Um, those things, you know, we basically created a, a table of like, these are the things that we want and scored different approaches according to what those things could be. And some of them were technology things directly, like, you know, database support, et cetera. Some of them were like, how easy is it gonna be to, um, to hire for people there? How easy is it gonna to be to, de to uh, deploy on-prem? How easy is it gonna to be to um, debug things on-prem? Because uh, that was definitely a concern that I had from, from my Palantir years of like, you know, if something goes wrong, your deployment is super far away. You might not even get logs. Like how, how, can, you, how can you debug it? So there was definitely like a, a process of thinking about what are the different things we care about and how do different approaches rank up um, and what do we know? Uh, yeah. And yeah. Yeah, that's so, Oh, go ahead, Mark. Sorry, <laughs> I'm just so excited. Uh, the, so you guys arrived on Java, right? As, as the main like Cortex. No, dot .NET, dot .NET. Oh, okay. Cause I was gonna say like that, that's, I, I've never worked in .NET. So, but if I had to pick one given those requirements it would be Java. Cause I just assume Java has support for every darn database out there no matter how old. Yep. And, yeah, yeah. Okay. there were there were different there were different considerations uh, and you know but anyway yeah go ahead what were you, you going to no, uh, that that's really interesting and so I guess it's all like the actual code is C sharp in, in yeah this? it's all C sharp I mean the front end is obviously TypeScript uh, yeah. but the the back end is all done and, and there's there's a bit of Python actually because we do some machine learning stuff that like just wasn't worth trying to do it in C sharp uh, so we have a microservice that handles some mm -hmm. of the Python stuff. So um, kind of a follow-up question to that is, given the number of databases that Tonic supports, is it hard to staff an engineering team with school the, the skills for to cover all those? Yeah, um, we interview for it. I mean, if you interview as a back-end engineer or full-stack engineer at Tonic, expect questions about databases. <laughs> um, uh, and you know, if you don't do so well on the database stuff, that it's like not, it's, yeah, it, it, it's important for us. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and there are some things that you can't interview for though. Like we're never gonna find a DB2 expert um, if, we, if we just interview. Uh, so for that, we have 
we basically contracted out teachers essentially. So mm-hmm. we won't hire someone to do a DB2 implementation. Instead, we'll hire someone to, to answer whatever questions we have as we do it ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and that you know gives us the expertise in, in-house while also leveraging someone else's knowledge. Um, and then for some of the technologies, they're just so new, like you know Snowflake and Redshift, uh, that you just want to hire people that are eager to learn, um, because that's the only way you're going to be able to catch up with the fast and the new. Yeah, turning that question actually over to you, Mark. How much of your process has involved um, you adding to or further develop- developing uh, your existing areas of expertise? Well, uh, so I guess one thing that is different with Makaru versus Tonic is, is Makaru has just like a ton of data types. So having to, to find those and mine them and understand them and, and figure out, I get requests all the time for, for this data type or that type of data type and trying to figure out which ones are, you know, actually more likely to help the most people. I think that's expanded my skill set. Um, certainly in the, in the beginning of Makru, I really didn't have a lot of experience building an application that would be widely used. Like I, I had dealt with applications that had very complex data and large data sets, but never had to deal with like concurrency of users and, and highly availability and, and those kinds of things. And like, all right, now I'm gonna start knocking Ruby on Rails. But uh, one of the downsides of Rails is like, it has memory leaks. I, I think pretty much everybody that has a, an app with Rails that does anything significant, like it runs out of memory and needs to be restarted. and so. I really had to learn the skills of like managing servers and managing services and making them reliable and dealing with all the, the, the chaos of real world applications in that setting. Before I had mostly done Java and, and Java's VM is just so rock solid that um, you can really rely on it to just stick around and, and not be restarted for years. Rails, not so much. It's a little bit you know more simplistic. I mean, it could be worse. I could be using Node. Node is like, needs to constantly be brought out in the back and shot and then <laughs> restored. Um, Kubernetes is great for that, uh, but uh, Rails is kind of a, a happy medium. So yeah, I had to learn a lot of skills. And then, you know, through other jobs and stuff, I wound up using those quite a bit. Um, so my piece of advice for any employer out there, by the way, is seek out people that have side projects and encourage them to do so. Mm-hmm. Because I've brought so much knowledge from stuff I did on my side projects that go and help my main job that I really feel sorry for some companies that are like, that look down upon that or, or are very cautious about allowing people to use their own time. You only make your staff stronger when you do that. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Uh, we have an interesting question from the audience. How do, uh, how do each of you think about being opinionated versus being more developer friendly, customizable with code? Mm. Yeah, uh, I can take a, a first stab at that. I think, it's a really great question. I mean, and one again, once again, everything is a trade-off and there isn't a right answer. But my answer is uh, for, you know, there is value in having more of an opinion within an organization um, and then maybe using libraries that en- enable you to achieve those, those goals or those opinions. Um, so like for Tonic itself, we are running you know, various static code analyses, various checks on any commit, whatever, that make sure things are formatted according to their standards, but also you know, other uh, kind of code quality things that might come up. Um, and, and also just like the architecture of, for example, the front end, it's there to provide you with the rail that you need to be on so that you can do the thing the way it's supposed to be done. And like, if someone were to make a code, uh, a PR, I was just looking at a PR recently and um, uh, one of our engineers introduced like an alternative async paradigm. And I was like, let's not introduce any new async paradigms. Let's stick with the async paradigms we've got so that we're a little bit more like, at least things are a little bit more consistent, you know? So I think within an organization, it's, it's important to be opinionated because it helps communicate it helps keep people on the same path and then be able to, um, you know, have someone fill in when someone else is sick or whatever, you know, people can read each other's code more, more, more carefully. When it comes to the library, like if I were build, developing a library um, and the libraries we use, uh, we use, we tend to use libraries that are not, that are like pretty mainstream and therefore like 
you know, as libraries get more and more mainstream, they often tend to add more and more features. And we're using .NET and like Entity Framework and that kind of thing. And they're pretty flexible uh, and I'm fine with that. Um, you know, if I was, if we were smaller, maybe something even more opinionated would be better. Uh, but I think, you know, when you pick your libraries, pick the ones that are gonna support the opinions you want. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I'm internally consistent on this one because it's like, I, I'm, uh, I'm a lover of Ruby on Rails, which is the opinionated web framework. Um, hmm. And I, I totally agree with, with what you said, like in building a team, I always try to get the team to use as few technologies as is practical um, because it's just so hard to have team members jumping between five or six different languages to you know find and recruit a staff that has that skill set um, and so we we you know we try to make conscious choices about finding the best tool for the job but balancing that with using the fewest amount of tools possible um, because what I want, you know, I, I, my experience is all in startups and fast moving environments and you want people to be able to drop in and out of any part of the system at will as is needed. Um, the, the, it's, it's so comforting to work on a team when anybody can solve any problem. And you facilitate that by having as few different patterns and technologies as possible so that people can context switch easily. But that said, like for opinionated things, it's fine as long as I agree with the opinion. And there's some mainstream ones out there that I've just never agreed with. Like I, I'm part of this um, clubhouse room every Thursday called JavaScript Thursdays, where we just talk about the latest stuff in JavaScript. And every discussion devolves into, so what state management framework should I use for React? It's like every week, it's the same thing. And the, Redux is the most popular one. And I hate Redux, just hate it with a passion. I mean, it's just like overthought, over-engineered, God, why? None of this stuff makes any intuitive sense. What the heck is a reducer? It sounds so, like so what's the answer? What's the answer? Since hooks came out, I just use hooks. Hooks and use yeah. state and context. Yeah. I just roll my own. Before that, I was a, a very much a, a proponent of MobX, which I just thought yeah. was way more performant, way more simple. Um, the only reason I think that, that people have a bone to pick with MobX is it's kind of anti-React in that it takes control away from React and it's, it's, mm. it's rendering reconciliation. But it does so by, it makes the whole app much faster and much more reliable in performance. And it's just a simpler model. So I get why people use Redux. It's great, the bigger the team you have, the more order Redux enforces you know, it's got great dev tools, but for me personally, like, ah, no, it's just too weird. Um, yeah. and, and the tools that React now gives you, you know, many of which owe their existence to Redux and the patterns that it established, I feel like are just a better choice for, for the teams I've worked on. They give you a bit more flexibility and are just simpler. So, uh, you know, I followed a similar path to you, but I kind of got off the train a little, got, yeah, I never left the train I was on, which is like, <laughs> I use Redux, I was just like, man, there's so much boilerplate. I just, I never, I just, let me try something different. Let me see what else is out there. And then I tried MobX and uh, that's what we're using right now. Um, and we haven't made the leap to, to uh, hooks and, and the new React stuff, um, but maybe someday. Yeah, so I, in the earlier this year, I, I rebuilt the front end for, for Makaru and Makaru used to have a little bit of MobX in there, but and now it's just use state in context. I don't, yeah. I don't know if that's the right choice for everybody because I've, I've been with React since the beginning and it's literally a huge part of my, my day job to be an expert in React. So I'm, I have a very different angle on it. Like I'm very comfortable in the internals of it. Um, but it, it, with other junior members on, on my team, it seems to be you know, fine to, to, to stick to that and not use a, a framework or um, a state management library. Yeah. I'll jump in with another question from the audience. Um, do you think, uh, and I, I think this is probably for both of you, this testing tool is easy for a business analyst team to adapt with as they know more about business use cases and which data elements need um, mock-ups of data versus scrambling PII of data? Um, okay, go ahead. I can I take that uh, at least to start. So like, one of the things I'm proud of with Makaru is that it, it appears very simple. Um, and so there's a a layer of it that is really meant for anybody of any technical background. Like anybody can show up at the homepage and put together data that resembles what they need. But it does have a, a level under the surface where you can do very sophisticated things with the Ruby scripting, formulas, custom distributions. And so I, 
I don't know that I designed it this way, but it turned out this way, that it, it does have a very wide appeal that folks who are non-technical or not developers, but maybe they're you know, data scientists or, uh, or just you know, other business users uh, use it quite frequently, uh, salespeople and QA engineers and, and people that aren't developers. So I, I hope the answer is yes, that it, it, it adapts well for those folks. And, and one way that everybody out there can help is to be vocal in asking for new data types. Um, don't feel like that you have to engineer everything from scratch when it's not there. I add new data types all the time and it, it is what it is because of what people have asked for. So, sorry, Andrew, go ahead. Yeah, no, great. Um, I mean, it is what it is because what people ask for is like the story of every great product, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, completely agree with that sentiment. Um, I feel like in many times, like a startup's advantage or any company's advantage is really just like, who talked to them and like, you know, if, if you, if you got the right conversations, if you were there earlier, so you had more conversations, that's just, that's your advantage. You know, you know more because you talk to more people. Um, to answer the question, uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, I also agree. Uh, I, I think Tonic is a tool that um, is not geared only towards developers. I mean, it's actually very point and click. Uh, we have many uh, analysts and business analysts and DBAs um, using Tonic every day uh, to create data sets that satisfy their testing needs and grow with the testing needs as they change. Um, it's a you know it's a it's a pretty straightforward UI to use, um, and I think that opens up the ability for anyone to use it. And furthermore, uh, it also kind of it's keeping track of your database. So, you know, one of the big differences with Tonic and Makru, Tonic is connected to your database and like actively using your database as a way to know what to create. And uh, because it's connected to your database, it actually can monitor it for changes that might require you to intervene and say like, oh, well, a new table was added. Let's make sure that we get data for that table or a new column was added or uh, PII showed up in a place that PII wasn't showing up before. Um, so yeah. Uh, those are things that we've all thought about first, you know, uh, as, as first class uh, features that we want. So following up on the, it is what it is because people asked for it. Um, this is an interesting question about when you're scaling up, how have you thought about quality versus velocity in your engineering stack, particular, particularly when going through scale up periods for your products? Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's another great question. It's, it's, and it's like definitely a, I don't know. I feel like it's like a wisdom thing to a degree, or maybe some people just get it right from the start. I don't know, but it's very much like a careful trade-off and a careful balance you need to hold because um, the more you require certain quality checks, it's going to have an impact on your ability to move quickly. Uh, you know, part of the purpose of deep automated testing is to make sure you don't change things, you know, like when you uh, create a sophisticated automation test end to end testing, like you're testing that this thing stays the same as it ever was. And like, sometimes the right answer, how many times, you know, raise your hand if you've had to change a unit test, because actually the desired outcome is changed. It's not like, you know, like now, now, now we have a different outcome. And so that means you're doing more work. Um, and, you know, uh, definitely, uh, that's not to say unit tests are bad. And like, there's, there's, um, they're, they're very valuable and we use them at Tonic, uh, especially there's a lot of algorithmic stuff in Tonic that like you need to test the algorithm and it's, it's like, you know, it'd be impossible as a human to just look at the output and be like, oh yeah, this looks statistically right. Like that's not a thing. Like <laughs> you need, you need a computer to examine it and really, uh, uh, and understand the distributions of the input and the output and like compare those distributions, et cetera. Um, but it is a really valid question. Like, you know, how do you trade off velocity versus quality? And the, the I guess the advice that I would give you is, uh, the advice that I would give you is kind of similar to the advice that I gave earlier, which is, you know, like, it doesn't matter until it does, don't prematurely optimize. Like, be economical about this too. Um, you know, knock on wood, Tonic hasn't had any major security failures or any major bugs that have caused like a really big issue for any of our customers. And now we have over 50 customers. Um, and uh, yeah, um, 
So, so perhaps you'll, you know, you'll, you'll, you're going to ask me this question again in like two months after there's a major outage and I'll be like quality <laughs> first, quality yeah. first every time. But, uh, but for now, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to, cause we have a lot of, we have a lot of aspirations, a lot of ambitions, uh, and we want to keep the velocity high. Um, so, so we're trying to be economical, but not too economical. It's, it's a really tough question. There's no, there's no right answer. Yeah, I think um, it depends on the, the risks involved and the domain that you're in and, and what's right for that domain. You know, if you're in finance, then quality first. Um, if you're in safety, you know, quality first. Um, and there's an interesting trade-off that, that I've wrestled with over the years of learning, unit tests versus integration tests. Uh, and I recently had to like have a kind of a come to Jesus moment in, in the work that we're doing with Rust. So Rust, for those of you who don't know, it's a, it's a pretty different language, but it's a language where the compiler really beats you up. Like a compiler is like a strict Catholic school nun over you with a switch, like just beating on you to, 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 to write the perfect piece of code that has no uh, memory leaks, that uh, has no like concurrent modification of shared references, like all this low level stuff. But it's not easy to write unit tests for. It's not as well developed uh, a, a unit testing, you know, community as like a JavaScript. I think is uh, JavaScript and Ruby actually both have really great unit testing communities. Like in in Rust, you can't really get a coverage report um, yet. I mean, I hope that changes. But um, what I found is that unit tests are. are not as valuable unless you're committed to 100% coverage, which sounds like a tall order in that the difference between projects where we say we're going to have 100% coverage all the time versus projects where like we're going to have really good unit testing is like there's a actually a very wide gap there. Um, mm -hmm. Because when you have 100% coverage, you can immediately know if something lapsed, like you immediately know if there's something uncovered because going from 100 to 99 is an easy thing to notice. Going from like everything's in the 90s and like one thing changed by 1% and noticing that in a, in a PR is like, it's very difficult. So I, if I'm going to really invest in unit testing, I want to go all the way and say, we're going to do 100% coverage and we're going to check that on every PR. But that aside, we also do a ton of integration testing. This is not on Makaru, but this is another thing that I've, I've been working on for years. We do a lot of integration testing. They actually found that the integration testing is actually much more valuable than the unit testing. It finds more real world problems. Um, and, and so I think if I had to choose one, I would invest more in integration testing. It's a little bit harder to develop. It slows down your velocity at the beginning, but then it really finds the real world problems. Um, yeah. And if, you, you know, if you're not gonna do 100% code coverage with unit testing, where you can make unit testing help you is Sometimes there's code that's easier to write test first. Like I'm not one of these people that subscribes to test first development as a religion, but sometimes it's just harder to write code that you're going to have to manually interact with, with your browser, other than to just like write the test and write the code alongside. It actually helps you write the code faster. So it can be used as a tool just for increasing your velocity if you use it right. Um, but yeah, I'm, I would not have said this five years ago, but I'm a big proponent of hundred percent test coverage now because of what I've seen it. The, the safety that it ensures across teams and, and the easy easiness to notice when that diverges from that hundred percent. Um, there's a couple of things that I wanted to follow up on there. Uh, so the idea of, you know, what matters and where does it matter? That's a really good point, Mark, uh, especially like even within a code base too, right? Like you can have like, you know, sure FinTech and healthcare or whatever safety, but within our code base, Tonic's code base, there are some really sensitive algorithms that are really, really need to be right and like hard to, to know if they're right. Like, for example, we have encryption algorithms. Uh, we have a lot of statistical stuff that, you know, is pouring through data and then trying to create new data like it. Uh, we have subsetting algorithm, which is just like a really intricate algorithm that slowly crawls a database. And um, those things are great candidates for automated testing, whether it's like slightly higher than unit testing, but maybe not as far as integration testing, whatever you want to call that. Yeah. Uh, I usually just call it unit testing. Um, and we definitely focus on those because like if those get wrong, then data does not get produced the way we promised it did. And that can be 
you know, that's bad for panic. <laughs> um, we want our customers to be confident that the data we're producing is good. So, you know, it's like, we skimp maybe on some of the UI unit tests, but we're heavier on some of the backend algorithmic tests. Yeah, I, I definitely forgive that in my projects. Like where, where we do the least amount of testing is the UI unit testing wise. Um, unless like I've, I've been on projects where we're actually building component libraries, like for React, and then yeah. unit testing is really great there because your surface area is so large, your surface area is your API. So you need automated tests. But if you're just building an application that's not one of the first things I would invest in is automated testing of the UI. Um, people that can do that well are not cheap <laughs> and it's, it's a lot of work to do. It's and very then, hard. And yeah. then, you know, you change your design because you arrive at a better UX and then it's like, well, throw out all your tests now. So it's, it's yep. a frustrating road to hoe. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we have a question that's more about like the space that, that these platforms are in. Are there any specific problems that you think synthetic data tools can solve in the future that you're excited about? And the example they give is testing and QA for machine learning. And I think there already is work being done there. Um, God, I need to read a book on machine learning. This is like so hard to know everything in, in tech. And that is one of my weakest areas. And, and if I knew more, Makaru would be a more useful tool. And that's probably where I need to go next. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I think uh, one of the things recently I was talking to a, a customer about um, was that it's actually like an emerging um, financial standard for like credit card information interchange yeah. that, that is, it, it's not adopted yet, but they're banking on it being adopted and being the future. And that's where, you know, Makaru is really helpful. Like there's no, they don't have any data to reproduce or, or to, to, to fake. And so their ask was a very tall one in that there's like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of fields they need to, to synthetically create. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm proud to be able to, to help with that kind of stuff. And, and my heart has always lied with innovation and creating new stuff. And so <laughs> Makaru serves that, you know, pretty well. Um, but yeah. Andrew, there. Yeah. Um, it's a really open space right now. And there are a lot of companies taking that at, from different angles. Tonic's perspective is that we've been focused on structured data. Um, so that's like data, data that looks like either a table or a JSON document, right? Um, and I think for Tonic, interesting avenues of further exploration would be around the unstructured stuff like images and uh, text. There's like phenomenal advances in both of those already in the academics uh, in the, and also in industry. Um, you know, there's the GPT-2 and 3, uh, and then there's the Google deep image synthesis stuff. Um, so for Tonic, that's like an interesting next step that I think we, we are interested in taking. But uh, there are other companies that are, that, that's their first step. Um, like there are companies that are looking at image synthesis as like the, the you know, the, the number one thing to solve for them. Um, so it's hard to even know, like, you know, what's the next step for data synthesis because it's such a broad field right now that, and so many people are in it that it's like, you know, to Mark's earlier point, it's impossible to know everything in tech. And so, you know, my next step might be someone's first step. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Uh, a couple more questions from the audience. What trade-offs are there building for few users versus many users or for building by few versus many engineers? Mm, good questions. Um, I'll, I'll start maybe with the few users versus many users. Um, one thing I would say is, well, there's a variety of things here. There's like the architecture of few users versus many users. Uh, I don't have as much to say about that, even though that is the topic here. Uh, I was going to say the, the user experience of few users versus many users is also another interesting thing, which affects architecture. Uh, and I would encourage you to design, I typically des design for many users, design and by that I mean like, you know, your UX, how it's gonna feel to use your product, design for many users because that's going to open the, the you know, open the gates of who you can design or who can use your product. Um, and making your product easier and more accessible is like always better. Even those users that are like, oh, I'm the power user, I don't care. Like, just give me a freaking terminal. That's all I need. Like, 
Yeah, there are ones that actually are true about that, but a lot of them that use the terminal, if you gave them some point and click, they would like it more uh, and they'd be stickier and they would use it longer and, and all those things. So I'm a proponent of like trying to make your designs as simple as possible. On the architecture side of it, um, you know, I've, in my time at Palantir and Tonic, we've never, never had to really architect for many users and like internet scale, many users. Uh, our, most of my services are, you know, dealing with hundreds of users at most. Um, and so I don't know if I have as much to, to add there. I think Mark, you might, yeah. you might yeah. have some thoughts. My recent work in the last, you know, five years has been internet scale for sure. Um, so uh, I think, you know, one thing designing for few users sucks. <laughs> I hate, like one of the best things in my early days in my career, I designed a product that had few users. It was a very valuable product. It was a great job. Love the people I work with. But what bothered me was like, you get these whale customers that come in and, and you know, they want you to add a salad spinner to your application. It's the most important thing for them. Uh, and they dictate a lot of your design um, and that can hurt down the line where you start getting more users. And then your application is this weird design that made sense to this one guy who had a huge contract with you. And that just stinks. The, the faster you can get to even a lot of free users, I feel like the better, pro better your product will be in terms of design um, because all those opinions and people banging away at it harden it very quickly. And it, in the beginning, it kind of humbles you as an engineer, as a, as a designer, but it's a relief when you arrive at something that is working every day for lots of people of different skill sets and, and backgrounds. So I, for me personally, like I will always try to guide my career towards the things that have lots of users because it's just, it's, it's more fulfilling and it's actually easier, I think, um, because the feedback comes so rapidly that you know when you've done something wrong and you don't get too far down a wrong path before the internet guides you back to, you know, something that's more usable. Um, designing, you know, for large teams versus small teams is an interesting one too. Um, I've mostly worked on small teams, but um, have some experience with larger teams as well. And with the larger the team, the more concrete you need to be in the contracts between either the services or the, the teams. Um, all those different touch points, you know, need to be well documented, need to be well tested. And that is not having to do that is an advantage for small teams, for sure. Like if, if you're a team of, you know, five or 10 and you can get away with everybody banging away on the same monolithic code set, you're going to be much faster. Uh, that just doesn't scale to infinity. Um, and it's hard to make monoliths scale technically as well. Uh, you know, the, the, the thing that makes startups possible these days and why we have such a boom in innovation is the clouds. You know, the story of the last 15 years of computing was AWS and, and commoditizing cloud resources. And everybody needs to build for taking advantage of that type of cloud today. Um, and so whether you like it or not, that is many services that are specialized uh, and, and using services like AWS to scale. Um, so there's that tension between monoliths and microservices again. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I think you need to be level-headed about picking and choosing. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great point about, I, I forgot about the, the big teams versus small teams and I agree with everything you said. Um, the, uh, yeah, just like that point about the contracts needing to be very, very, very solid. And that's where you spend a lot of time, you know, communicating, documenting, testing is 100% true once you go like, and, and, and I would encourage people to try to keep things as small as possible for as long as possible, because it's so, you're so much faster. Uh, there's so much less ceremony, so much less overhead. Um, but once you get past 30, 40, 50 developers, things start needing to be different than 15 people crushing on a monolith. Yeah, and in, in business speak or Silicon Valley speak, don't scale until you have product market fit. That's the, the other way of thinking about it yeah. is, it's so, it's brutal to be in a business where you thought you had PMF and you've scaled and now you need to go find PMF. It's, yep. it's just so difficult to move quickly and, and to try to figure out how to make use of a large team of engineers. You, you find work for them that really doesn't need to be done. And then you have to you know, notice that you're doing that. So yeah, definitely stay small as long as possible until you're forced to get bigger by demand.
Yeah. So we've got a, a we're coming up on the hour and we've got a question that is great to end on. Um, there are more questions from the audience. Um, what I might do is just ping you guys afterwards um, and I can shoot off some emails to people to get their questions answered. But this question, I'm going to ask it in two different ways. If you could do everything over again, what would you do differently? Or what do you know now that you wish you'd known when you started? Well, I can take that. Um, there are parts of Ruby that are not a great choice for an application like Makaru. Um, Ruby's not the highest performing language out there. And uh, I would be able to scale to, to much larger sizes more cheaply. You, know, you can pay Amazon to scale anything, no matter how slow to, to any size, <laughs> but your bank account only goes so deep. Um, but if I had had the foresight to use something lower level, uh, and I think then these technologies didn't even really, it, the choice would have been something like C or maybe Java. Now there's a, a language that I love, which is the same syntax as Ruby called Crystal, which is basically uh, a, a systems level language with very forgiving syntax. It's super, super fast. It's like as fast as C. Someday I will rewrite parts of Makaru and Crystal and I'll be able to generate, you know, a thousand times as much data in the same amount of time. I, I wish I had had the foresight to know, you know, how successful it would be and, and maybe choose some different technologies for the, the computationally intensive parts of, of Makaru. Um, so yeah, that's my, the one thing I would love to change. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're starting a company, you're always trying to, this is the, what is the, the analogy is if you're always trying to skate to the puck and not, you know, where the puck is or whatever, the ice hockey analogy. Um, and uh, I think when we started Tonic, you know, on-prem was a really important model for us. And I think it's still a very important model for us. I think 10 years from now, looking back on that, you're going to, you're going to see that there's more and more hosted opportunities, more and more cloud. And it's not that I would necessarily, if I did, if I could do it over, I would just say like, no, we're, we're, we're a cloud only cloud first. But um, I definitely foresee in the next years that being a big tension for uh, products like Tonic and Tonic. Um, and, and, you know, maybe 10 years from now, I'll look back and be like, that was, that was actually dumb. Like we should have just been hosted cloud first. Uh, well, we'll see, you know, um, there are different, and then with all the legislation happening right now too, maybe on-prem we'll get like a resurgence because data sovereignty and um, all that jazz. Yeah. Um, there were more questions we could have asked, but this has been awesome. Uh, thank you guys both so much for your time. Any final thoughts you'd like to chime in with? Or did we cover everything? Well, I hope everybody enjoyed it. This is a little bit of a different, you know, talk for us nerds, you know, talking about architecture and coding and stuff. I love doing this stuff. So, and there was a pretty good turnout. So hopefully we can, you know, do something along these lines again. Um, just, yeah. you know, thank you everybody for, for turning out and, and thank you for using Makaru. Yeah, absolutely. Echo those words. Thank you. Uh, thank you for showing up and I hope you learned something about Tonic, about Makaru, et cetera. Yeah, um, uh, definitely we'll be hosting more events like this because it's just, it's wonderful just to have you guys kind of uh, share your thoughts and ideas in all these areas. Um, I did put up on the screen um, how you can contact us if you'd like to reach out. You've got an email address for, for both Makro and Tonic. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at our different handles and our websites as well. Uh, let me see, just one last quick mention of the workshop that we are uh, hosting next week. Go on to tonic.ai, click on webinars, and you'll find the registration page there. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Andrew. And we look forward to the next, next conversation. Likewise. Great. Thank you, Kiara. Yep. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>